Hi, in this uh, talk, uh, me and Thanos are going to go over uh, libvfi user, um, give a, a quick status update. Uh, we're going to be focusing on the library itself, um, but first we'll give a little bit of history, um, an update of uh, the protocol definition, um, uh, a quick demo hopefully, and then we'll discuss uh, some of the ongoing and future work. So uh, two years ago in the KVM Forum 2019, uh, my colleagues uh, Thanos and Swapnil presented M user. Um, the idea of this was the ability to uh, implement a device inside a separate user space process, so separate from uh, Kimu. Um, and this was based upon the uh, VFIO MDEV framework at the time, um, and as a, a result, had um, some disadvantages. It worked well as a proof of concept but it did require a um, kernel module as well as a kernel patch. Um, much has changed since then. Um, and in particular, uh, we at Nutanix have worked with the community to define uh, an alternative approach uh, that is much better in many ways. In particular, it doesn't require any kernel changes um, and uh, has significant advantages um, in terms of the simplicity of the implementation. Um, and in particular, since uh, people who may have seen MUSER previously, the APIs of the library have completely changed. So uh, what is the VFI user protocol? Um, so essentially it's a protocol for uh, providing management of external device servers. So that's uh, a device implementation running in a separate process. Um, this has uh, the same motivations as uh, MUSER did, which around performance, security, resilience, um, you may have attended uh, talks on this topic uh, earlier. Um, it's essentially a message protocol over a communication channel. Um, most typically that's going to be a Unix socket to another process on the same host, um, but other configurations are certainly possible. Um, could include uh, TCP sockets, uh, having an implementation in another VM, for example. Um, it's similar to um, the VFIO uh, IOCTL interface. Um, in fact, it's based upon that in many ways. Um, and you can think of it as analogous to a uh, vhost user, except that instead of being specific to the VertIO protocol, um, it uh, can implement generic devices, um, although typically this would be a PCI uh, endpoint. Um, and it's also worth pointing out this is VMM agnostic. There's nothing specific to the uh, KEMU implementation in the protocol. Um, so these are the main uh, message types that you would see in the protocol um, based around basics of lifecycle handling of the device, um, configuring interrupts for the device, um, and ac uh, providing access to both device memory, device regions, uh, and uh, guest memory. Um, so as I mentioned, we're going to talk mainly about the uh, library interface and implementation, however. Um, so libvfi user is a C library. It has two main roles. Um, the first one is the socket server. So that's uh, implementing the server side of the uh, protocol I just mentioned. And then the other part is that um, it provides easy support for implementing a PCI device. Um, it has uh, an API for synchronous and asynchronous uh, implementations. Um, and the diagram here gives just sort of one example of a possible uh, usage where we have cloud hypervisor running a VM, um, talking a VFI user protocol over a socket um, to uh, SPDK, which has implemented a virtual NVMe PCI controller. So here's a quick hello world example of how you might use the library. Um, so you can see in uh, the beginning, we create a context. Uh, we specify that we would like to use um, a Unix socket and we would like to create a PCI device. Um, we configure it with um, one device region here, which is bar two. Um, we set up an IRQ for the device. Uh, we set up um, some callbacks for guest memory, which we'll talk about shortly. And then we essentially sit in a loop um, handling the protocol messages coming through. On the right hand side, you can see some sketches of what the callbacks uh, might look like. Um, the bar two callback, uh, when, for example, you may 
look at the offset that's passed through and correspond that to a particular register in your device implementation and uh, handle that uh, register access, whether it's a read or a write. Um, equally, as we'll discuss briefly, um, you can have callbacks when uh, guest memory is mapped. Um, and this is um, an example of the information you can get in that callback. Okay, so as we mentioned, <clears throat> the uh, library simplifies implementing a PCI device in the sense that we have a, an implementation of most of PCI config space um, and handling of things like uh, capabilities um, and various uh, well-known standard endpoint registers. Um, it's not a fully uh, complete implementation. Um, we're essentially demand faulting things in uh, as we discover they're necessary to be implemented, um, but it handles the majority of cases uh, without consumers of the library needing to worry themselves about uh, PCI specification uh, details. Um, it's possible to actually fully delegate the config space handling, um, and that's useful for uh, the multi-process QEMU work on the server side. Um, you can, uh, as we saw, you can add callbacks for uh, the device specific implementation of bars. Um, and you can also have vendor specific capabilities, um, which are also uh, handled via callbacks. Um, IRQ handling. So this is just uh, an example of uh, a walkthrough showing how uh, IRQ handling might work. Uh, so during initial setup, uh, QEMU or another VFI user client uh, may use the set IRQs message to essentially pass us an event FD that corresponds to um, a particular IRQ vector. And then let's say we have an MMIO right from the VM that corresponds to, for example, a, a doorbell right for a storage device. Um, that's uh, handled at the um, VMM side by QEMU, uh, which then becomes, uh, for example, a region right uh, message across to a uh, libvfi user. Uh, and the device implementation callback uh, may uh, process it as an IO request. And when the IO completes, it will raise a guest IRQ via the uh, VFU IRQ trigger um, callback. And that would then correspond to uh, an event FD write. And Kimi, for example, may ha have that routed through to an IRQ FD to eventually raise the IRQ uh, on the guest side. Um, device region access. Uh, so this is um, allowing uh, parts of a, a device, for example, bars, uh, to be accessed by the client uh, or by the VM. Um, so in the uh, diagram here, for example, we have bar zero, um, and that's actually a, a temporary file uh, managed by the uh, VFI user server process. And um, in step one, we can actually share that with the client by uh, passing a file descriptor along the socket message. Um, and that allows the client to directly mmap that same file, which can then be also plumbed through to the VM so that a VM can directly access all or parts of uh, a device without needing any VM exits or any uh, socket messages at all. Um, that's obviously device specific in terms of which parts should be uh, shared directly to the VM um, and which uh, should be handled via uh, MMIO. Um, so in steps three and four, this will be an example of how um, a non-mapped uh, access might happen. We would get a, an exit into QEMU and then QEMU uh, would uh, send a message doing the request for the region, which uh, would be handled by the device implementation typically. Um, so the other side of the coin, it's also possible um, to share uh, VM guest memory with the device implementation. Um, so in this case, we have uh, Kimu has created some uh, backing storage for um, VM memory, uh, which is a huge pages device, uh, which is then mapped into both uh, the Kimu process and set up such that the um, VM can access that same memory. Um, and it will, QEMU will typically send a, uh, a message across the socket to the 
device implementation, uh, essentially announcing the uh, range of that memory that has just been mapped by the guest. Um, so typically the information there would um, have the sort of the, the, the DMA addresses and size of that region. Uh, often this will correspond to the guest physical address, um, but this could be different with a virtual IO MMU implementation, for example. Um, again, optionally, this uh, memory can be directly shared by passing a file descriptor across. And in that case, the device implementation server can directly mmap um, the guest memory and consequently access guest memory without needing any socket messages. Um, the API you see on the right is some of the ways with which a device implementation can actually access this memory. So if you think of um, IO rings or IO buffers, that would be one obvious example of um, when a device implementation would need to access this memory. Um, yeah, um, we also handle uh, dirty page tracking uh, via uh, these APIs uh, for live migration, which we'll talk about um, very shortly. Um, and now I'm going to uh, pass over to Thanos, who's going to talk about live migration, give us a, a quick demo and talk about some uh, future work. Thanks, John. Support for live migration is a recently added feature in LibVFIO user. In VFIO, live migration uses a special device region, the migration region, which must contain at the beginning a set of specific registers. LibVFIO user uses this mechanism and provides an optional API for simplifying live migration for the device. To enable live migration, the user must set up the migration region and provide certain callbacks that are executed by the library when the device is live migrated. These callbacks are the device state transition callback, which is executed when the guest changes the device's migration state. The main states are the running state, which is the default state. At the source, we have the pre-copy state, where the device is still used by the guest, but can you copy his migration data in the background, and the stop and copy state, where the device is not used by the guest, and can you copies the remaining migration data. In the meantime, at the destination, we have the resuming state where QEMU receives migration data from the source QEMU and writes it to the device. When it's done, it switches to the running state. The next callback is the get pending bytes callback. During the pre-copy and stop and copy states, QEMU executes the get pending bytes callback where the device gets to tell QEMU how much migration data is left to be copied. QEMU then proceeds with reading this data either directly from memory if the device chooses to make the migration region memory mappable, or by executing the read data callback where the device returns a buffer with the data. QEMU keeps doing this until, this until the device returns zero from this callback to indicate that there's no more data to migrate. In the meantime, at the destination, QEMU calls the prepare data callback where the destination device tells it where to write, where to write the migration data. Then QEMU proceeds with either writing this migration data directly to the migration region, if it's memory mappable, or by calling the write data and data written callbacks to explicitly provide the migration data to the device. It repeats these steps until all migration data have been written. In our original M user presentation, we demonstrated a GPIO device, which is a simple device with an external pin that is either zero or one, and that can be read, read from the host driver. We'll now demonstrate the same device implemented using the latest LibVFIO user. We'll then live migrate this virtual device to another host, except where the destination device is implemented in Rust using LibVFIO user rather than C. Let's quickly look at the uh, GP GPIO implementation. Uh, it's essentially what John showed earlier. We create a libvfi user context. We initialize the PCI configuration space. We set up bar two region. Then we also set up the migration region and then configure it to use the migration callbacks. 
we then configure our queues and then finally realize the device implementation and run the device. Let's build and run the GPA of device. Let's run it. Now let's run the source key new. Initialize the device in the guest. Now, whenever we read the pin, it flips from zero to one every three times it's read. So let's read it. Let's read it one, zero, zero, then one, then zero again. Now let's go to the destination. Let's quickly look at the Rust implementation. It's very similar to the C implementation. We create the lead BFI user socket uh, context. We initialize the configuration space. We set up, set up bar two, then the migration region, and then the migration callbacks right here. And then we finalize device simulation and then run it. Let's build and run the Rust GPIO device. And now let's start keying you at the destination. And now, let's like migrate it. migrated let's keep reading we read it at the source after it flipped and it was zero so it should be zero two more times and then it should flip to one zero zero and then it correctly flips to one and then back to zero We're still at the beginning of making device simulation easier with the VFI user. First, we want to make the library more stable and add more automated testing. Also, we want to make use of the ongoing work on IO region 15 KVM that allows for faster MMIO when a device region isn't memory mappable. Another area to improve on is the client using a virtual IO MMU. Although this is a VFI user client matter, we can certainly do more to make it easier for the devices to cope with more complex DMA requirements. Better PCI support would be nice to have, for instance, handling more PCI capabilities or supporting PCI bridges. Multi-threading is also on our list since some libvfi user functions are not thread safe. Making device simulation restartable would be great since that would give us better resilience and would make upgrades more lightweight. Supporting transports other than a Unix domain socket, as well as other device types, is also on our, on our list. Finally, we'd like to explore how LibVFI user can be used to perform hardware device mediation and SRIOV. LibVFI user is on GitHub and it's BSD licensed. We have a mailing list, but the best way to reach us is via Slack. Thank you.